here during their ninth year here at Gel High as they lived in or moved here from Bryn Mawr, where they lived for 40 years before that. So that, um, Miko is a graduate of Earlham College in Indiana, and she, she tells you 20 years later she went back to Villanova to get her Bachelor of Science in Library Science. So that, now Herb is a graduate of Penn State. I am a graduate of Iowa State. So and I want you all Penn Staters to know that the sky is blue and white in Iowa as well. <laughs> Not only does he a graduate of Penn State, but he also has a degree from Temple University with a doctorate in counseling psychology. He served in the Air Force as a navigator for three years. So they have three children and six grandchildren. So that, and they're wonderful, wonderful people. Okay, Miko, did I do all right? I said, did I do all right? Good. What a height to get up here. And remember, you're much younger than I. Not that much younger. All right, am I on? Can you hear me? All right, here we go. I think um, you can turn out some of the lights. No? Okay, never mind. <clears throat> well, I'm just um, curious to know, how many of you took American history in high school or college? Good, very good. Well, did you um, all learn about the Japanese Americans incarceration during World War II on the West Coast? Not too many. Uh, I know there, it wasn't taught in all the high schools, so um, I'm not surprised. Maybe you heard about it, but um, this is a lesson, history lesson, on what happened to the Japanese and Japanese Americans during World War II on the West Coast. So here we go. My road to America's concentration camps in Arkansas and Arizona started on Sunday, December 7, 1941, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. No one in my family had the vaguest notion of the changes that were to take place in our lives. In retrospect, it is clear to see that what was about to happen was not only unconstitutional, but unprecedented for the freedoms guaranteed to American citizens were violated. To fully understand the tragic events, which meant the uprooting of families and the interruption or destruction of businesses, it seems important to review a segment of Japanese American history, and in particular, of the racial prejudice that existed on the West Coast. Immigrants of any kind of any origin suffer prejudicial abuse from those who are already inhabitants. But in most cases, immigrants from Europe are assimilated relatively quickly, while Asians and blacks, due to clear physical differences of any kind, are features that become targets for those who are bigoted. The Japanese were but one of a series of Asians who were victims of discrimination on the West Coast. The first victims were the Chinese, followed by the Japanese, the Filipinos, and then the Koreans. The stereotypes given to all Asians began to flourish. They were pictured to be quiet, stoic, sly, and radically different from Europeans in such a way that they could never be assimilated into the mainstream of American society. During this period, several organized groups emerged with their main objective, focused on the deportation of Asians from the mainland. A number of prejudicial legislations and policies were adopted. The Gentlemen's Agreement of 1908 was an agreement between the United States and Japan. It stated that if Japan agreed to stop its laborers from entering the United States, America would agree 
to desegregate Japanese American students from his schools. In 1913, Japanese farmers were prohibited from owning land in the West Coast states. In 1922, only white persons and aliens from Africa were allowed to become naturalized citizens. All Asian immigrants were barred from doing so. And in 1924, Congress passed the Exclusion Act, which prohibited Japanese entirely to immigrate to the United States. From the beginning of World War II, a number of events coming as if in waves struck the Japanese populace in California, Oregon, and Washington. On December 7th, there was a selective incarceration of Japanese males who were arrested and placed in prison without trial. The total number of Japanese incarcerated was 2,192. My father was among them. The rationale for his arrest was that he was the secretary of the Japanese Association, and seemingly all leaders of Japanese communities were taken into custody. My father, who had graduated from high school in Maui, Hawaii, and from college in Missouri in 1924, was taken to the Sacramento County Jail and held there for three days without visitation privileges. I remember rumors of his being shipped out. My mother and uncle went to the jail only to find out that it was too late to see him. He had already been taken into the train where window shades were drawn. As a result, he was not seen, not even to say goodbye. We learned later that he had been taken to Bismarck, North Dakota, where he was incarcerated for six months. The Japanese were not allowed access to their banks severely limiting the business transactions among Japanese businessmen and creating hardships in meeting the essential needs of the individual family. A number of restrictions was placed on the Japanese, aliens and citizens alike. A curfew was established. We were all restricted to our homes by 8 p.m. Travel was limited to a radius of five miles from the place of residence. At times, special consideration was requested. My mother, who was expecting her fifth child, requested a variance on the curfew restriction for she could not predict the exact time of her delivery. I might add that the incarceration of my mother, or my father, was about to place a huge burden on my mother who was to be faced with the problems of closing our homes in Florin, California, and moving to the detention center with four, perhaps five young children, of whom I was the oldest at seven years. Fortunately, my uncle, our only relative in the United States, was able to move in with us and help us out in this ordeal. The uprooting of families was perhaps one of the two tragic events that were to take place. Lives that were established were disrupted or destroyed. The other, obviously, is the incarceration in concentration camps. Executive Order 9066, an order signed by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt on February 19, 1942, was a document insignificant to most Americans. This order directed the removal of all Japanese, aliens and citizens alike, from the designated areas of the West Coast into one of the 10 concentration camps. The victims of this incarceration committed no crime other than being Japanese. It seems that this was the culmination of the efforts of the anti-Asian organizations to rid the West Coast of Japanese. Thus, a total of 120,313 people of Japanese ancestry, of whom 
two thirds were United States citizens, were placed behind barbed wire and armed guards. The way in which Executive Order 9066 was put into operation varied among localities. In some areas, the Japanese had several weeks notice prior to the time of forced removals. In other places, such as Terminal Island, a small fishing community located south of Los Angeles, the residents had as little as 48 hours. Closing homes and selling or storing possessions were filled with complications. People were faced with little time and the options were few. They sold their possessions at unreasonably low prices. They left their belongings stored in their homes or they simply abandoned them because they did not trust the government for storage. On May 28, 1942, my family, which now included a month old baby boy, was removed to the Fresno Assembly Center. That is, except for another brother, aged two and a half, who was in the incubation period for months. The medical authorities insisted that he remain behind, so he was taken tearfully by ambulance to the county hospital, while the rest of the family traveled to the temporary detention center. These detention centers were meant to be temporary quarters, usually built on county fairgrounds or racetracks. Fresno was one of the 16 detention centers. Housing was in animal sheds and tar-papered barracks. <coughs> our bedding was on canvas cots. Our mattresses were simply a bag filled with straw. The bathroom facilities <coughs> were communal, <coughs> excuse me, as were the dining facilities. Typically, we stood in lines to enter the mess halls <coughs> and latrines. Normal family life, which traditionally held great significance for the, Jap for the Japanese, was severely disrupted. It was not unusual for parents to lose contact with their children during the day. Thus, the teaching of values such as responsibility, respect, and discipline did not receive adequate attention. Most important was that the basic family unit became fragmented. This camp community was hurriedly constructed so that sidewalks and roads <coughs> were not provided. As a result, after rains, we found ourselves in a sea of mud. Because of the mud, our rooms were very difficult to keep clean. Shoes and clothes that were wet had difficulty drying. The already cramped quarters, which lacked privacy because of only partial walls, seemed to become even smaller. Although the evictions took place during the school year, schools were not readily provided to the children of these families. In October of 1942, we were moved to a permanent concentration camp in Jerome, Arkansas, which was situated close to the swamps of the Mississippi River. When we arrived, construction was not completed. We were confronted with cold, rain, and mud during the winter season. We were housed in black tar-papered barracks. Each barrack was partitioned into six rooms, the smallest rooms were reserved usually for couples or bachelors. The larger rooms for families. The barracks were arranged by block and it included 12 barracks, a central mess hall, a central latrine, a laundry room, and a recreational room. Each room had a ceiling from which dangled a light bulb. Otherwise, the rooms were equipped with a stove for heating and army cots and mattresses. Other furnishings had to be constructed by the occupants from scrap lumber. A room 24 feet by 20 feet was <coughs> occupied by one family, regardless of size. There were many variations in the ways families devised partitioning this limited space into living and sleeping areas. 
privacy was rarely experienced, if at all. The Japanese organized their own police and fire departments, <clears throat> as well as their own hospitals and churches. These detainees were able to obtain jobs in various support agencies. Men who had owned restaurants volunteered to cook in the kitchens. <coughs> Others labored, to, labored as farmers, dishwashers, garbage collectors, and others worked to feed the occupants. <clears throat> People not employed in the dining areas organized recreational programs, became carpenters, janitors, pharmacists, mechanics, mailmen, messengers, translators, and office workers. These workers' salaries range from $8 per month in unskilled classification to $19 per month for professional jobs. Interestingly, Japanese American physicians, engineers, dentists, and teachers worked along with Caucasians who drew the full civil service pay. My father, who was bilingual, worked in the library and translated news and concerns into Japanese for the older detainees. For this, he was paid $19 per month. Schools were eventually established within the concentration camps. Faculty was composed of detainees as well as Caucasians. Qualifications varied widely among teachers from those who completed college to those who simply finished high school. Schools attempted to pursue what was felt to be the appropriate curriculum within the confines of limited facilities. Outside of school were various <coughs> interest groups where people could develop their skills in gardening, <coughs> painting, sculpture, sewing, knitting, flower arrangements, and other crafts. Other groups focused on poetry and bridge. Entertainment was provided by movies or plays and talent shows. Other recreation was found in organized athletic teams in baseball, basketball, sumo wrestling, ping pong, and marbles. On occasions, the Japanese were given passes to shop in the nearby town of McGee, Arkansas. It was at this time when we passed the armed guards and the barbed wire fences that we fully realized the limits placed on our freedom. Without the pass, we were not permitted to venture out. For many of our needs, we did not have to shop in town. A canteen co-op was established. Here, medication, clothing, and snacks were available. Major clothing purchases were usually made through mail-order catalogs, mainly Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Ward. By October of 1942, policies and procedures to leave the concentration camps were beginning to be liberalized. Detainees seeking permission to take jobs outside the camps had their records checked by the FBI. This security was necessary in order to assure the host communities that the Japanese were loyal. Approximately eight months after we arrived in Arkansas, we were ordered to move to another camp in Arizona by the name of Gila, an Indian and desert territory located south of Phoenix. This move was an attempt to consolidate the camps rather than to have a number of partially filled camps thanks to the liberalized exit policies, which enabled people to relocate to various cities in the East. Jerome was the center selected to be closed entirely because of the poor climatic conditions. The situation at Gila was similar in organization and appearance um, to Jerome. One, of, one major difference was that we did not have to face barbed wire fences, or armed guards. The authorities felt that the arid desert which surrounded the camp would be enough to discourage people from contemplating escape. After January of 1943, the United States Army announced that they were prepared to organize a military unit 
composed entirely of Japanese Americans. Much to the surprise of everyone, there was a great outpouring of interest among the males to volunteer for this unit. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team was organized. It experienced battles in Italy and France. It is reputed to be the most highly decorated unit for its size and length of service. The outpouring of enthusiasm to join this unit is related to the intensity of the mot motivation felt by the detainees to prove their loyalty. Furthermore, combat was not restricted to Europe, but also to special individuals in the Pacific, where Japanese Americans served as interpreters, interrogating prisoners, performing reconnaissance behind enemy lines, and risking severe punishment if captured. In 1943, the government strongly started to encourage the Japanese to seek clearance so that they could relocate to areas in the eastern sectors of the United States. Many left to work as migrant farmers, initially to do seasonal work and to return to camp after the harvest. A number of individuals were assisted to leave the concentration camps by the Quakers and the American Friends Service Committee in Philadelphia. In many instances, the people aided were students who were helped in entering colleges and schools and in finding housing and jobs in their new locations. My father accepted the role of exploring a possible relocation of a large group of de detainees to Seabrook, New Jersey. A committee of three was formed to explore the possibilities of living and working in the frozen food plant in this South Jersey community. Seabrook Farms was in great need of workers and because they were successful in receiving a subsidy from the Federal Housing Authority, they were able to provide suitable living accommodations. My father's committee was able to thoroughly investigate the possibilities. Their report was made, uh, was able to thoroughly, uh, the possibilities, their report was made available to other camps. I suspect that he encouraged the people to make this move. Needless to say, a number of detainees were insecure about venturing into the open society. Although the restrictions of concentration camps were severe, they did feel a level of security. Enough people agreed to the move, and my father led an exodus of 2,500 homeless detainees to Seabrook, New Jersey. The date of our freedom <clears throat> was May 1st, 1945. My family had been incarcerated for three years. Now that's the end of my story, but this, what happened to us happened to many of the other Japanese and Japanese American families who were in the camps. So I know Herb's family was in a different situation. He came from San Francisco, but his mother's family lived in Watsonville, so in order for them to be moved together, Herb's family from San Francisco moved to Watsonville so they could be moved to the camps altogether and not be separated in, into two different camps. So that's what happened with his family. But he can tell you about his stories. He was only about uh, seven years old, nine years old, and <coughs> He was a very mischievous child, <laughs> as you can imagine. And he's the same. He's still the same. <laughs> well, anyway, um, in San Francisco, because he only had a brother who was seven years older, his mother had a very tight rein on her. And he got into trouble in Catholic schools as kindergarten and in first grade. And when he went to camp, he was playing around with other boys and he was never around the house. His mother had a very hard time keeping track of him. And, and he also lied about his age. And he got into, he was supposed to be a Cub Scout, but he got into the Boy Scout. <laughs> he lied. And then he was supposed to be in, in the fourth grade, but he lied and was put himself in the fifth grade because he was big for his age. But... <clears throat> 
when he was about to leave the camp. Because they had friends, Quaker friends, in Philadelphia and who were willing to sponsor Herb's family to move to Philadelphia. He had, Herb had to have an interview with the principal of the school in camp. So when the principal looked at Herb's report card, <laughs> the principal said, well, Herb, your report card is terrible. You, you have D's and F's. And the principal said, I'm going to change it. So he changed it to all A's and B's. <laughs> Can you imagine a principal doing that? Well, anyway, the principal said, OK, now when you go to your next school in Philadelphia, you have to put yourself in grade four, not grade five, where you are now, because you lied about your age, and you should be in grade four anyway. So when he got to Friends Select School in Philadelphia, and he had the interview with the, the uh, principal, or the headmaster of Friends Select, the headmaster said, oh, you Herb, your grades are good. You're going to be in fifth grade. <laughs> and Herb said, no, I want to be in fourth grade. And the principal said, why? Your grades are good. You should be in fifth grade. And Herb said, no, I want to be in fourth grade, because he had promised the other principal that he was going to go down one grade. But actually, when he lied about that age, he, would, he put himself in the correct grade because he lied when he was in camp that he was in fifth grade, but he should have been in fourth grade because he was big for his age and he wanted to be with his friends. So he lied about being in fifth grade. And when he got to Friends Select, he put himself in fourth grade where he belonged. And that's where he went. And then after that, he. He went to uh, Friends Select up through the ninth grade, and then he wanted to play football. And Friends Select had no football team. So he wanted to go to Central High School. And so he, he made, had a good grade because, you know, he had no friends to play with in Philadelphia. So he had to study. <laughs> he had to study, and he had good teachers at Friends Select. So he was able to get into Central. And there he played football. So that's, that, he was very happy with that. And so that's what happened with, with her. So his story is very different from, um, from mine. But as you know, we all went through the same kind of uh, experiences in the concentration camps. Okay? And I might add that on the back wall there, there's a display. And one of the books there is a recent book called daughter of Molokai. Molokai is an island in Hawaii and is known as a leper colony or leper island. Well, anyway, there was a, a young well, baby at that time, a baby girl, who was put in the orphanage there at Molokai. And at, when she grew up, there was a Japanese uh, couple who wanted to adopt her. So they adopted her and brought her to California and lo and behold, they end up in Florin, California, where I was born. So I couldn't believe it. It was such a small world that there would be a book written about my hometown that I never even knew it existed. So anyway, that's, that's what happened. And anyway, I haven't finished reading the book yet, so I don't know how it, how it turns out. But um, I know that the book tells about a lot of the racism that, that occurred in California at that time. Before even the war, uh, there was a lot of racism. And, and because the Japanese farmers were very good farmers, I think the, uh, the white farmers were becoming jealous of their, their success. And so they wanted, little by little, to get rid of the Japanese. And this is what happened all along the West Coast. And when the war broke out, that's what happened. We had to move. Yes, Eileen? Where did you meet her? Oh, that was many, many years later. As you remember, when we left camp, I was in the fifth grade. Okay. So we had to go through grammar school, high school, college. And Herb did the same. He went to Friends Select, to Central High School, and Penn you State. Didn't mention where he went for college. We've already heard that. OK. <laughs> Sorry. 
anyway, um, so we didn't meet until after he got out of the Air Force, and I was working in Philadelphia, and we went to a party. And we went to a party because his aunt was in charge of this uh, exhibit that we, where we worked. But, and Herb was working there, and I was working there, but we were so busy, we didn't have a chance to meet. So Aunt Mary decided to have a party so that <laughs> Herb could meet some young women. Because he was just out of the Air Force, he didn't know anyone. So anyway, we had the party at his house in West Philadelphia. And when we went there, there were only three guys and the rest of the, us were women. <laughs> so I found out much later that he had a list of the women <laughs> that he wanted to date. And I was not number one. <laughs> I was number two. <laughs> but after that, he didn't have to go down any further. <laughs> so that's, that's how we met, I mean. Okay? Now I want to go over the statistics that um, that are kind of interesting. Can you see the uh, screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. In March of 1942 was the forced removal of Japanese and Japanese Americans. There were 120,313 Japanese and Japanese Americans that were incarcerated. There were four detainees who were killed by the army guards. And there were uh, 1,866 detainees who died in camp. It was due to disease or old age. And there were um, 4,724 detainees who were deported to Japan. And there were 2,355 males who left camp to join the American Armed Forces. An estimated 14,000 Japanese Americans and Japanese Hawaiians formed the 442nd and 100th Regimental Combat Team, the RCT. There were 21 Congressional Medal of Honors that were awarded to the Japanese American servicemen. And there were 9,486 Purple Hearts that were awarded to the Japanese Americans who served in the American military services. In March of 1946, the last of the concentration camps were closed. And in 1952, there was the passage of the Walter McCarran Act, which allowed Asian immigrants to become naturalized citizens. My father was among them. In August of 1979, President Jimmy Carter and Congress appointed a nine-member commission to investigate the experiences and make recommendations. The commission released its findings that the incarceration was the result of racism, war hysteria, and failure of political leadership. And in 19, oh, 1980, August of 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act into law requiring a payment of $20,000 and a formal apology to an estimated 60,000 survivors of incarceration. So yes, I received $20,000 and so did her. But uh, his parents did not because they were already deceased by that time. So now um, that's the end of my presentation. And if you have any questions or comments or know of anyone who went through this experience, you know, raise your hands and I'll be glad to hear you. Yes, Phil? Okay, Herb, Herb, you want to come forward and, and get a microphone? Wait, no, go ahead. You let him out already. Wait. <laughs> Judy's going to give you the microphone. Who, who is it? I think it's Herb. Herb, give it to Herb so he can answer the question. Well, I, th I think uh, Nico already spilled the beans. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I don't have any more to, any more to add to, to that other than uh, that uh, we had separate courses uh, of our lives leaving camp. Uh, we, we were fortunate to have uh, friends on the outside who helped. My, my brother received a 
scholarship to go to Westtown School, which is right here in Chester County. So he, he was there. He was actually didn't graduate because he was drafted into the army uh, before he had graduation. So my, my mother picked up his uh, diploma on, on commencement. Uh, and uh, uh, he was uh, uh, in the army during the war. However, by the time he finished his training in, in the uh, language school, the war was over. So he went over to Japan. And that was the first time he ever went to Japan. And uh, he met our, our relatives over there. Yes, Cal? Wait a minute, wait, we'll get the microphone to you. We can't hear you otherwise. Didn't they have detention centers on the East Coast? Uh, there were some German aliens during the war because you know Germany had uh, um, submarines that came close to the eastern shore, but um, Thank you. they were not incarcerated as wholehearted. You know they were not wholly incarcerated as we were. They were not rounded up like we were. I think there were too many German and German Americans, and um, they just you know after all they were Europeans, but we were Asians, so they could pick on us more easily. Yes, over here. Um. Patty, yeah. Oh, never mind. Oh, thank you. Um, have either you or Herb returned to Japan to see it? Well, I, I know Herb went back with the Temple University basketball team um, <laughs> when he was the counseling center director. But that was not until no, 1990, something like that. And I went to Japan for the first time in my life in 1999 because we just didn't have the money to travel until then. And I had written for a grant to travel to Japan to see, compare uh, Japanese schools, girls' schools, because I was, I was working in a um, girls' school in, in um, Chestnut Hill. So anyway, I wanted to see how they differed from uh, our school. And so that's why I wrote the grant, and we were given the grant, and so we were able to go to Japan my first time. And that was her second time, but the first time he went, it was with the basketball team. While you're in the camp, how important was it to maintain a Japanese culture, like language and food, gardening, et cetera? And how difficult was it? I think it was very difficult to keep the Japanese culture in the families. Uh, it was difficult for the parents because that's what they knew, especially if they were first generation or immigrants from Japan. My father, um, was an immigrant, well, he was an immigrant, as you know, but he was, he went to uh, high school in Maui and then graduated from college in Missouri. So he was sort of Americanized and he could speak both languages, he was bilingual. My mother, on the other hand, was born in California along with her brother, younger brother who lived with us, but her family moved back to Japan and um, she came back as a, um, as a bride, because in those days, the men could not marry outside your race or vice versa. You had to marry within your race. And, and because of the Exclusion Act, there was a lack of people to marry. And so, because my mother was an American citizen, she was able to come back more easily than, say, an immigrant. But my mother, um, was so happy. I mean, she didn't care about getting married to a Japanese man, you know, who was intended. She just wanted to get back to America. She just loved America better than her life in Japan. So she came back, and a week later, they were married. And they were married in 1934. And in 1935, I was born. And then after that, 
two years later, every two years it seems, there was another child. <laughs> a lot of uh, families in those days were arranged marriages, and because they were farmers too, they, you know, they wanted to have large families so that the kids could work. But it was it was difficult. But we did keep some of our cultural uh, traditions, you know, like food and eating with chopsticks. And um, well, in camp, there was uh, some talent shows that that promoted some of the uh, dances and and some of the songs, perhaps. But um, within within the camp families, it was really difficult because the kids were just too busy being uh, playing around and, and um, you know, they were just fooling around now and going to school, trying to go to school. So it was, it was more difficult for them to try to keep that up. But we're trying now, <laughs> in my family, we have three children. And of course, we, we eat Japanese food and we eat chopsticks and I cook Japanese food. And we go to Japanese restaurants whenever there's a, a nice one. It's hard to find around here, though. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, anyway, we try, but it's more cultural. I mean, very surfacy. You know, you can't really speak the language. I can't write the language. Um, so it's difficult. But you know, we're Americans, and so that's what we know. We, we're just Americanized. Miko. Yes. Hold on. Uh, just a second. Maybe um, I was looking for a microphone, and maybe I, uh, you said this, but when we, were you reunited with your father since he was taken away before the rest of your family? How, how many years or whatever? Not years. It's just about six months. Just six months. Okay, and great. And then he, he came to us when we were in uh, Fresno, and then... Right after that, we had to move to Arkansas. So he was with us then. Oh, okay. And then in Arkansas, my mother had her sixth, sixth child. So I guess they were happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, then, if there are no other questions or comments, that'll be it. Thank you very much. display case back there. There's some some nice um, pictures and documents. <laughs>